Okay, uh, today's scripture reading is taken from two portions of scripture. The first one, Psalm 13, verses 1 to 2. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And the second scripture is Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so today we are very glad to have our, our guest speaker here, Dato Jory Long, who is no stranger, but let me read um, a short bio data of him. So Dato Jory Long worships at Sungai Wei Subang Methodist Church, PJ. He's the chairman of the church's uh, executive committee. He's also the chairman of Scripture Union for Peninsular Malaysia and a board member of Asian Outreach Malaysia. Dr. Jory is a partner of an established law firm in KL and is also a qualified chartered accountant. He's also an independent non-executive director of uh, several public listed companies. He believes Christians in the marketplace are called to be redemptive agents of God. Uh, he's joyfully married and is blessed with three children and his wife is here today with us as well. So maybe you can just say hi to her after this. <laughs> yeah, so uh, welcome. Put your hands together to welcome Dr. Jory. Thank you. Noel, for the introduction, and uh, a very good morning to all of you. I hope all of you are keeping well. Um, it's a very good weather today, and um, I was a bit concerned whether I could make it on time, and uh, when I switched on my ways, we were not, were not only on time, but it was, traffic was very smooth, and we reached here uh, well within time. Um, it's always a privilege to be in the house of the Lord, to share the word of God. And um, even though we are in masks, uh, I can't say that uh, even without masks, sometimes we don't recognize people uh, nowadays. And uh, I've actually gone to places whereby somebody can literally be within a meter of me and uh, they say hello and I had to pause for about five seconds and wonder who or she is. Uh, because sometimes even in church, we have not seen people for months or for years. Um, let me start with uh, my first slide. The title of my sermon this morning is um, It's Okay Not to Be Okay. About um, six months ago, or a bit more, sorry, towards the end of last year, I received a video message from a friend of mine. I share this story with his permission, even though I'll keep his identity uh, confidential. Let's, for the purpose of uh, my sharing this morning, uh, let's refer to him as Ricky. When I received his video message, naturally I switched it on. But when I viewed his video message, I was taken aback. And the reason is this. In the video, Ricky, who is a gentleman who is in his early or mid-60s, was crying loudly. And in the midst of his crying, he was very emotional. He was sobbing and expressing great relief and thankfulness to God for healing him. In that short few minutes video message, he also thanked God for friends, for family, who stood alongside with him through that episode of illness. Ricky, it took me by surprise because Ricky not only is somebody who is older, elderly, I've known him for some years as a person who's very calm and collected. A person who just retired from a, corporate, a senior corporate position. So in that setting, for him to respond that way, it was extremely unexpected and unusual. So, naturally, I decided after viewing the video message, I called him to ask how he is and ask him a bit more information. In my conversation with him, he told me that the few months before that, there was a day whereby he found out that he had a nerve disorder. And to cut a long story short, he was told by the doctor that if there was no intervention, it could have been fatal, he may have died, he could have died. 
And then in the days, weeks, months after that, he sought treatment. But in the process of fear and uncertainty, he went through a period of depression. He was getting very worried about his family, his life, and things in the future. He wasn't an active church goer, but because of that episode, he recommitted his life to God, decided to go back to church, and he received support from people in his church. You know, that video message reminded me that, you know, in life, and I'm sure in the midst of what um, the people that you know, there are people in our midst that do go through mental health issues. They do go through depression. I did my own mental calculation of people that I know that has gone through some form of mental health issue in the last, let's say, 24 months since the pandemic began. I counted no less than 10. And when I said no less than 10, I consciously avoided even counting people in my church because I know there were many more. But just to give you an illustration that mental health, therefore, is a very important and a prevalent issue. And I think it is necessary for, necessary for us in the church to address it. But what do I mean by mental health? Mental health essentially means the state of our mind, the state of our emotions, and the state of our behavior. And this morning, I want to share with you three things about mental health. First of all, mental health and the Psalms. The second thing I want to share with you about is mental health and the church. The third thing I want to share with you is about mental health and you. So it's a three-point sermon. I'm an LPL holder, so we are trained to have three-point sermons. But let me tell you a preacher's secret. When we tell you three-point sermons, it is not necessarily three points. What we don't tell you is that we have many, many sub-points. So it may be nine points, it may be ten points. But jokes aside, I hope I can address these three points as clearly and hopefully to be able to speak not only into your minds, but also into your hearts. Let me start by the first point, mental health and the Psalms. The Psalms is a book that are read, have been read by many of you over the years, I'm sure. And I'm sure each one of us will have our own favorite Psalm. But you know that one third, not less than one third of the book of Psalms is the Psalms of Lament. Psalms of Lament is known to many of you, but unfortunately the word lament, many of us don't use it in our normal day-to-day -day English usage, isn't it? But lament basically means passionate expression of sorrow, of grief, of distress, of despair. Basically, it means that we are sad. You know, when we are sad, we don't tell somebody, I am lamenting. I'm complaining, we don't say, I'm lamenting, because it sounds pretty old English. But in essence, when we read and know about the book of Psalms, it is to tell us and remind us that it is about a book that the psalmists, the writers, the authors of those relevant books were basically expressing their own um, grief, sorrow, and distress to God. And therefore, there are two things that Psalms of Lament reminds and teaches all of us. The first is that it is okay to have struggles because many of the book of Psalms articulate the personal struggle of the psalmist. There are many. Let me just show you Psalms 13 that was read to us shortly, uh, a short while ago. Verses 1 and 2. This is a psalm written by King David when he was running away from Saul, who was planning and plotting to kill him. And this is what <coughs> King David said. O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? You know, it may sound very familiar, but honestly speaking, if you think for a moment, how often do we publicly lament, especially in a person like King David? He was in an exalted position 
of royalty. He was a king. Most of us, especially us men, we tend to want to keep our emotions to ourselves. We are not so expressive. You know, in today's world, the world today is what I call hardwired to show only the good side of life, isn't it? For example, in our social media, IG, TikTok, um, what else? Twitter, Facebook. Generally, almost everybody will show only pictures of happy days, happy moments, happy hours, of traveling, eating, good family moments. But nobody will show you pictures of them hiding in the room crying or certain issues that they are going through. The optics, the perception from social media is basically that life is a life of bed and roses. But I'm sure all of us know that in reality, it may not be so. Life, we do have struggles. Life, we do have issues. At times, we are not okay. And we must also not mistake the fact that, you know, sometimes we think that by being faithful to God, there will be no problems in life. That is what I call the health and wealth gospel, which unfortunately has caused confusion to many people. Because thinking that by being a Christian, the good news of the Bible is that when the promises of God gives, are given to us, the only thing we receive is health and wealth. And therefore, people are ashamed when they go through difficult times and they have struggles. I think the point I want to remind us this morning is that it is okay for us to pause even this morning and to recognize that there may be seasons in our life when we struggle. Please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying therefore as Christians you must always wallow in our sorrow. Then that is also wrong. We must always be very sad. People come to church very unhappy all the time. No, that's not what I'm saying. We have a God of hope. We have a God who promises to rescue, to restore, and to redeem us. Yes, there are wonderful promises. But at the same time, we must never be ashamed to share with people when we have struggles in our life. The second thing, which is also sometimes taken for granted, is that it's okay to have complaints. In helping us to cope with mental health challenges, do you know that the book of Psalms is a book that provides a language for the heart and for our soul to express our deepest emotions and experiences? There are many, many verses. I just want to highlight three of them this morning. You know, look at Psalms 42. The psalmist says that day and night I have only tears for food. So for those of you who are people who say that, God, I don't know how to say, I don't know what to talk, I don't know what to say to you. Look at the book of Psalms. You know, such a beautiful language saying that food for him is tears. And Psalm 69 verse 2, the psalmist says that I sing in the miry depths where there's no foothold. No foothold food means what? means you continue to sink and sink and sink. I've come into the deep waters, the floods engulf me. It is a language of a suffering soul. Psalms 88, verse 18. You have taken away my companions and loved ones. This is a psalmist that is complaining to God, almost borderline accusing God of taking away people that he loved. And how did this psalmist end the book of Psalms 88? He says that darkness is my closest friend. I was doing some research that the book of Psalms, there are lots of lament, but it, it normally ends with some hope. But there are two books in the book of Psalms, and one of them is Psalms 88, where the author does not end the writing with any hope. Just like in verse 18, which is the last verse of Psalms 88, the author, the writer of this book of Psalms says that darkness is my closest friend. It is to remind us, maybe there are times in our season where the hope of rescue, the hope of redemption 
may not come so soon. I'm not saying that there will be no hope. I'm saying that there are times whereby we may need to linger and struggle with the Lord. Like Psalmist in Psalms 88 that says that darkness is my closest friend. An author, Christian theologian by the name of Catherine McBride, she wrote this book about eight years ago called Darkness is My Only Companion. If you look at the title of this book, you will know that it's taken from Psalms 88, verse 18. <coughs> she is a person that was struggling with depression. This is a book that she wrote to encourage people about mental illness. And this is what Catherine basically wrote in this book. She says that she found solace and support in the Psalms. And why? Because they provided a language and imagery for her to think through her own experience of bipolar disorder. In her experiences with depression, Catherine said in the darkness of Psalms 88, the inner turmoil of Psalms 40, 42 and 69, and the abandonment and loneliness of Psalms 142. You know, good mental health is not just about living with positive emotions only. It is about being honest with our emotions and then being able to express them and have the courage to ask for help. And that is the point I want to emphasize to us. When we talk about mental health, we talk about even living our life. It is not denying reality. It is not saying that the only thing I want to have in life is always happy moments. Life is never a straight line. Or life is never forever a mountaintop experience. Life has got mountaintop experiences and life also has got valley moments. When we deny the valley moments, we get ourselves knotted up in the world of artificial reality. And conversely, if we only aim for mountaintop experiences, when the mountaintop experience no longer is a mountaintop experience, do we know how to cope? we will forever wanting to aim for something that may be unachievable. The second thing I want to share with you and with us this morning is to address all of us, mental health and the church. And I think the most important thing to know, when we talk about mental health, if we want the church to be a place whereby People who are struggling with issues about mental health, they must find the church as a safe space. And what do I mean by safe space? Safe space is a word used much in the modern world today about a place whereby people do not feel judged, people do not feel embarrassed, people will not feel shamed when an issue is brought up. And the issue here I'm referring to is mental health. And in regards to safe space, let me share a few thoughts as I elaborate on it. How do a church make itself a place that is a safe space? The first thing is we need to speak openly. What do I mean by that? I think Noel was introducing me and some of you know that I'm a lawyer. I'm a trained accountant. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a counsellor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. Some of you may be wondering why, therefore, am I addressing this topic about mental health? And that is exactly the same question I asked myself even as I was pondering upon dealing with this whole issue about mental health. I asked myself, maybe I should not be talking, maybe somebody who's an expert should talk about it. When I entertained that thought, I actually was reinforcing the wrong notion of a church that mental health is only limited to the specialist. Then we get ourselves into trouble, isn't it? Not enough. Because we say that only certain people can talk about it. So when somebody suffers about mental health, we don't want to talk about it. Then which means that we create it like some shroud of mystery, some shroud of you know, uniqueness about it. Yes, it may be not 
so common. But the point is that we are therefore creating a difficult environment for people to raise it up. When somebody has got mental health issue, will our response be, don't talk to me. Talk to somebody else. Talk to the doctor. Talk to the specialist. We are therefore pushing the person away. And we need to therefore speak openly. I use the word openly meaning that some of us still speak. But we speak in the closet and therefore it becomes a gossip. Hey, so and so, you know, the daughter, the son has got this problem. That is not helpful. That will not create a safe space as a church for people suffering from mental health. That leads me to the second point. Why do people not speak openly? Is that we, there is a stigma. We must stop the stigma of mental health. <clears throat> Let me explain this way. If your heart has a blockage, you will go and see a cardiologist. If you have got broken bones, like my son, elder son, just had a broken Achilles tendon, he immediately went to see an orthopedic surgeon. If you've got cancerous cells in your body, you will go and see an oncologist. You will never second guess the need to see some, if any, of these specialists, isn't it? But when somebody is suffering from mental health issue, the default mode is that that person is spiritually weak, spiritually struggling, and the person is emotionally unstable. And chances are, we think so because we say that in our mind, that person maybe has not prayed enough, have not studied the Word of God enough, and therefore, we create the stigma that mental health is a sign, a symptom of spiritual weakness. And therefore, people don't want to talk about it, don't want to share about it. I'm sure most, if not all of you, belong to some cell groups, small groups. I'm sure you have heard people asking for prayer points when you are not well, when you have got a sickness, you have COVID, you have even a cough, your family member is not well. But how many would dare to openly share that, can I ask for prayer? when this relative, this loved one of mine, has got mental health problem. We will shy away from sharing because it is a stigma. It might be an indication of shame. Some years ago, my daughter, who is 19 years old, but those few years ago she was a young teenager, had a sleepover at a friend's house. And she stayed with a good friend of hers. It's about slightly older than her, a year older than her, two, older than her. She came back very troubled, and she's very close to my wife. She didn't share this with me, but she shared with my wife that she was so troubled and almost like in a state of shock. We, we, she, she told my wife that when she stayed over with this other friend of hers, she saw in that friend's home room, in her drawer, a collection of blades. B-L-A-D-E-S. And this friend of hers will from time to time when she cannot cope with issues, would use the blades to cut herself. I don't blame my daughter for being so shocked. As a young teenager, she did not know how to respond. She shared with her mom. And my wife rightly said that we must try to help this person. We know the family of this young girl. My wife in particular tried to reach out to the mom of this person. But instead of welcoming the help, they tried to dismiss the issue. They don't want to talk about it. If anything, it pains us more. Not because of how the reaction was, but it pains us more that there are people in church that are also hiding away from these issues and pushing away people who want to help them. Because there is still the stigma. 
that if my child, my son, my daughter goes through a mental health issue, it is an issue of shame. I better not talk to people, especially in the church. But if they don't talk to people in the church, where do they talk to? They talk to people outside the church. Do you know that I know of people outside the church? When they deal with issues, advising people on mental health issues, they don't only advise how to overcome. I know there are those who do. They even teach them ways in which to commit suicide. Because to them, it is the easiest way out. And I think that is the reality and the sadness of the problem. The third thing about church to want to become a safe space is that we must start educating. Again, I'm sharing from a perspective of a layman. If I can understand, you can understand. And I'll say this in the simplest form. There's a difference between our brain and our soul. Both, however, affects how we think, what we feel, and how we behave. But the brain is a physical organ in our mind, in our head. Soul is our spirit, um, emotions, and our will. Both of them affect how we think, how we behave. Either one can cause us to go through mental illness or depression. But if the mental illness is caused by the brain, it is therefore a physical issue. And therefore, we need to deal with it in that manner of the root cause, which is a physical issue. Therefore, we need physical help, intervention from a doctor. But of course, if our mental health issue is caused by our soul, then we need a different form of treatment, addressing, intervention, counselling, prayer, seeking the Lord. So what I'm trying to say is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. But chances are, especially in religious organisations like us, we tend to slant towards a soul problem, thinking that everything to do with mental health is a soul issue, and it is not a brain issue. And that's where we get it wrong. When the brain is dysfunctional, it can cause us to behave irrationally, feel differently, and one way of intervention is to get actually medical help. Last but not the least is that if the church is to be a safe space for people, we need to show empathy. Empathy is different from sympathy. Sympathy is to say, I'm sorry for what you're going through. But empathy goes one step further. You actually put yourself in the position of the person and feels for the person. So it is a deeper commitment. And generally, when we empathize with somebody, there is a prompting within us to go beyond just expressing a sorry expression, expression of words only. We do act upon it. And I think that is important. And as a community of faith, as a community of faith, we must realize one thing. When people go through mental health issue, depression, chances are the feeling is such that nobody cares for me. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands me. And how best to overcome that is that is by standing alongside somebody to be with that person. But maybe you may ask that I'm not trained. I don't know what to do. But all of us have this one ingredient, love. Love is expressed in many, many forms. And what example is this I want to share with you? Dr. Tan Su Yin, some of you heard of him. He is a mentor coach, former pastor in a church in PJ. He's now based in Singapore. He's heading an organization called Grace Works. <coughs> he has shared openly that he uh, has got his second, he's, he's married three times. Huh? Let me explain. He has shared openly that his second marriage failed through divorce and he has repented of it. He's now with his third wife. But when his first wife passed away through cancer, he went through a period of depression. And he really, really said that it was so bad that he hated waking up. It is that bad. The moment he wakes up, it hits him like a thunderbolt. The sinking feeling. And imagine this is a pastor. 
a trained theologian, he still can go through that. But one of the things that helped him overcome it was the fact that there was one friend, a church member, that would every Monday morning will drive his car to pick him up just to have a late brunch or an early lunch. And that person would just have lunch with him and they actually don't talk much. The person does not attempt to provide any so-called counselling or words of advice. And this is what Suyin said about this friend. He said that it was his presence, you see. He didn't take the pain away, but at least I knew I wasn't alone. You can face some things in life if you know you are not alone. This is a wonderful reminder to us that sometimes we don't need words to be an encourager. We need presence. We need love. And that's what this friend did for Suin. And this was therefore the reminder of Suin to people, to all of us, in his article that he wrote when he shared his testimony. He said that, be a good and empathetic listener. The ear is better than the mouth. And on this point, I want to also say this to the younger people in our midst. You can be the leader to encourage us because you know that I've learned this from my own children, that younger generations are less judgmental. You are more open-minded. Some may say, use a negative word, that you are too liberal. But I want to encourage you in a positive manner. Because the older generation tends to be very fast to judge, to assume, to make conclusions. But younger people are more tolerant. And because of that, you actually, the younger generation in our churches today, can set the standard for us to welcome people in a manner that does not threaten them including in the areas of mental illness. And I think that we, the older generation, needs to also allow room for this, for us to learn as well. The third thing I want to share is about mental health and you. So I've addressed about what the Word of God says through the Book of Psalms. I've addressed about the church at large. But I think at the end of the day, what is it for me? Some of you may be asking. And the first thing I want to encourage you, and when I say you, it may be some of you sitting here in the sanctuary this morning, or those of you who are participating remotely from your home or anywhere else, listening in to this sermon. The message may be for you if you're struggling with mental health issue. It may also be for somebody in your life, a loved one, a friend, a close colleague that may need help. And this is the word number one, seek help. Seek help means that maybe we need medical help. But again, it is not easy to determine at which point in time we need to seek medical intervention for mental health. Because you see, when we are sick, when we have fever, what is the symptom? We have high temperature, isn't it? When we have flu, we have a running nose. When we are having a sore throat, our throat is painful. Straight away, we know we are not well. But for mental illness, it's not so easy because all of us will feel sad from time to time, isn't it? At which level of sadness do we go and say that it is mental illness? Sadness can happen because uh, my mother scolded me, my father scolded me, my children disobeyed me. That is a sign of sadness, but does that mean I've got mental health problem? No. How about anxiety? Some of us are always anxious. You know, I, always, I, I spoke at the Father's Day, um, Father's Day sermon uh, a few weeks ago. And I was telling the people that, you know, as parents, we never fail to have anxiety for our children. Because you know why? When a child is born and one year old, 10 years old, 50 years old, that is still will forever be our child. Our fear, our worry for them will change. When they are one year old, we are fearful whether they can feed well. 
At 10 years old, we are worried whether they make enough friends. At 50 years old, we may be worried whether, no, sorry, at 30 years old, whether they marry well. At 50 years old, whether their children, our grandchildren are coping well. We worry. But it's how we cope with it is important, but it doesn't mean that we have mental health. Some of us cannot sleep, has got insomnia. Does that mean you got mental health? Those days when Liverpool loses matches, I want to be very honest with you. I cannot go to sleep because I get so annoyed, I get so upset. And it gets terrible if I have to preach the next morning. I'm in church for duty. I have to consciously shut my mind and say, never mind, Liverpool is still a great club. They still are. Some of you cannot sleep maybe because you had coffee or you have Chinese tea. Does that mean you have a mental health problem? No. So what I'm trying to tell you is this. Do not think that just because you cannot sleep, you feel sad, you straight away got mental health issue. But maybe in the simplest layman terms, let me explain this. But if your inability to sleep, if your anxiety, if your fear interrupts with your daily living, regularly and constantly, maybe you need medical intervention. If it is a momentary, seasonal, time-to-time worry, I think maybe it's okay. But again, this is a layman perspective. Who do you seek help from? I think that goes without fail, which is very important. We must seek help from God. When I say you need intervention, it also means godly, spiritual, divine intervention. Psalms 46 verse 1 is a verse that was read to us just now. But it's also a verse that many of us have read before. You know, this one verse is so promise-packed. I can actually preach one whole sermon on this one verse because if you look at this verse itself, there are three promises in that one verse alone. Firstly, it says that God is our refuge. A place of refuge is a place of safety. It's a safe space. So which means that when you are feeling unsafe, God is the safe space. That is the first part of this promise. But running to a safe space, into a refuge place, does that mean I overcome our fear? Not necessarily. So that's where the second promise comes. It says that God is our strength. So which means that not only God protects me, I can go into a hiding, a hiding place, God will also help me to transform my fear, anxiety into strength to help me to overcome. He will give me the strength to overcome my fear. So He kept me safe first. Then after that, when I calm down, He will give me strength. And what's the third promise? He says that God is always ready to help in times of trouble. Always ready. It's an assurance to me that God is not like some of us. When people come to us all the time, we get tired. When people want counselling help all the time, we get tired. But God never gets tired with us. He's always ready to say that, come, I'm ready to help you in times of trouble. Three wonderful promises for people who are going through uncertainties, fear, or anxiety. There is a young lady that I know through ministry outside my church. Yes, I'm involved in different Christian organizations. And this young lady struggles through depression for many years. And I share her story, this part of her story, with her permission again. For her, she uses social media to help her cope with her own inner turmoil, and also as a form of helping others. This is one of her many Facebook postings. This was posted in October 2021. She wrote this, Behind every smile, there is always a story to tell. It is a journey for me to accept and embrace myself for who I am. Oftentimes, I find uh, it hard. I find I might be hard on myself, but I'm I being reminded again how I am loved by God and people around me. No matter how many times I fall, I'm learning to pick myself up and continue to love again. By God's grace, I will keep doing it again and again. You know, this simple thing reminds me that it is a long haul issue for her. 
But at the same time, she clings on tight to God. She keeps reminding herself and are reminded by the Word of God. She, she is loved by God. And because she is loved by God, people around her who are Christians also love her. She clings on tightly to God. These are heartfelt words from somebody. And she's moving on in life. In fact, I just saw on Facebook yesterday, she's just got betrothed. She's about to get married. And praise God for the fact that she's moving along and finding a life partner in her life as well. The second place in which we can seek help is this. We also seek help from professionals. We also seek help from people who can provide uh, professional medical help to us. Sometime last year, my wife and I were approached by a young man who was about to get married, asking us to provide premarital counselling for he and his fiancée. By the way, over the years, my wife and I have been involved uh, to provide premarital counselling for people in our church and also our church. We have done for more than 10 young adults. And it was a natural evolution from our ministry to the youth, young adults, and people we knew for many years who could connect with us, ask us to encourage them before they get married. But there was something unique about this request. The uniqueness is this. The fiancé of this young man is going through counselling, psychiatric counselling. So, we paused and hesitated and we said, okay, we want to still help where we can to provide counselling, but there was something that, a condition we put, we said that before we start any counselling, can you make an appointment for Melissa and I to go and see your psychiatrist, the fiancé psychiatrist, and we did. The purpose is that we need to understand her condition from a medical perspective and to know where are her trigger points and where are the weak points, so that if and when we were to proceed with counselling, we do not want to contradict, we do not want to create more complication. Why I'm sharing this with you is because, even as Christians, Christian counselling and medical treatment intervention can go hand in hand. There's no such thing as one or the other. Do not think that even in medical field or even in physical illnesses, some years ago there was a teaching that says that if you want to seek divine healing from God, you cannot go to hospital, you cannot take medicine. The only way God can heal you, there was a teaching, the only way God can heal you is to stop all form of medication. I think we get into serious trouble if that is the theology. That is not the word of God. Seeking help is one form. But I want to also ask and tell those of you or your friends who are going through this that you cannot or should not just stop there thinking that it's only a receiving one-way street. You know that you, those of you who are struggling with mental health issue, can also offer help to people. You can also be an encourager. And this is found in the Bible actually. Paul was telling the church at Corinth, he wrote this, and this is the message version because it explains it most aptly. He, meaning that God, comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, He brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was here or there for us. Very simply put, is God, when God puts us through an experience, good or bad, we should not waste it. We should tell the Lord that I want to be a vessel, instrument of encouragement, of help to somebody else. And therefore, even if you are going through, going through means still in the throes and in the valley of your struggles. Don't think that it is a season of you just being useless. You can be an encourager to somebody. You can be of help to somebody. Matthew Warren, the surname may sound familiar to all of you. He was the youngest son of Rick and Kay Warren. Rick Warren 
is the senior pastor of Standard Black Church. He's the famous author of the book Purpose Driven Life. Rick Warren committed suicide in 2013 at the age um, of about early 30s. Or 28 years old, sorry. He suffered from depression from very, very young. According to his parents, he struggled from mental illness literally when he was a young, young child. So imagine for the son of a godly man, a pastor of a mega church, they could not deal and help him overcome. But they continued to show love. He finally took his own life. I've looked at the video. Actually, he took his own life through shooting himself. That's a story for another day. But subsequent to what happened, Rick Warren and his wife shared about this, that because of his own position in society and in the world, Rick and Kay Warren received not less than 35,000 letters of condolences from all over the world. 35,000. From church leaders, country leaders, from royalty, from friends, from relatives. But Rick says that of all the letters he received from kings, queens and presidents in his own words, the letters that mean most to him are letters received from people that Matthew helped when he was still alive. He helped by helping them cope with their own mental illness. So don't think just because Matthew Warren went through almost all his life with mental health illness, illness, he was a useless person. No. He was still used by God to bring some form of help to other people. And this is what Rick wrote in his journal. In God's garden, even broken trees bear fruit. If God only used perfect people, nothing would ever get done, isn't it? How true. God uses all of us in spite of our struggles. We are all broken trees in one form or another. But we must continue to bear fruit and we must continue to be a vessel used by God to bless other people. As I bring my sermon to a close, this is the reason why I've entitled my sermon, It's Okay Not to Be Okay. It is to remind us that as a human being, or even more so as a Christian, it is okay for us to go to seasons of struggles. And even if we are not well with our mental state, it is okay not to be okay. But it should not just end there. Because much as there is no shame to go through mental illness, but I want to encourage us is that having acknowledged that do not remain unwell, Seek help from God. Seek help from friends, family, and if need be, also from professionals. That is the first takeaway point for all of us here this morning. And the second takeaway point is for all of us here, especially those in leadership, because you set the tone of the church, is that the church must be a safe space for people who are struggling with mental health. Let the church be God's agent of healing. People must not feel that when they come to church, they are judged, they are shamed, they are questioned. We want to encourage them to overcome issues in their life. I'm going to close now with a video clip to just help us to concretize the thoughts of what I have shared this morning. This video is a video from, um, of a song sung by a group called The Afters. The name of the song is You Lift Me Up. They are not as popular as some bands that you have may, you may heard, 
but they have been used by God in different uh, corners of the world. When they produced this video, uh, this is what <coughs> the band leader wrote as to the purpose of their video. They said that we wanted this video to reflect the realities of life. While our stories might not be the same, which is true, isn't it? All of us are different. The thing we all share in common is that when we face the things in life that are too much for us to handle on our own, God is with us, God is for us, and God will never fail us. I hope that this video is an encouragement to people and a reminder of God's faithfulness. So as we watch this video, I just want to encourage us to be ministered by God. And maybe even the worship team, can you just come up and we may, right after this, just close and really commit this time to the Lord. Just watch. Waiting for the sunrise, waiting for the day, waiting for a sign that I'm where you want me to be. You know my heart is heavy and the hurt is deep, but when I feel I give enough, you're reminding me that we all fall down sometimes. When I hit the ground I'm not perfect, I know I make mistakes, I know that I've let you down, but you love me the same, and when I'm surrounded, when I lose my way, when I'm crying out and falling down, you are here to lift me. As the words of the song say, God knows your heart is heavy and the hurt is deep. But when you feel like giving up, 
God is reminding us that He lifts us up with His love. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help us in times of trouble. So even as I close this morning, I just want to encourage us to open our hearts to the Lord. Because when we come before the Lord, the Lord is a person that will never reject us. The world may reject us. And the saddest part is that sometimes people whom we love may have rejected you, consciously or unconsciously. I just want to end by praying for us and you this morning. Even as I ask Shinley to pray, I uh, to play a song, and as the worship team, even sing a song of ministry, in your own quiet way, can you respond to the Lord? And ask the Lord to help you to release unto Him the pains, the struggles, the sadness. And ask the Lord to lift us up and help us be that overcomer and to know that our Lord is ever ready to help us in times of trouble.